I should start this video off by saying that, before making it, I was unfamiliar with Pete Davidson's work. I don't watch SNL and I don't keep up with celebrity gossip, either. Ironically, a bit like Pete's friend Machine Gun Kelly, almost everything I knew about Davidson was incidental, and largely information I was exposed to without my desire or consent. So going into this, I wasn't familiar with Davidson outside of the bits of information which had filtered down to me like pop cultural detritus. When it came time to watch Davidson's first Netflix special, Alive from New York, I didn't know what to expect. I had some vague recollections of what people said when it came out over three years ago, but I was kind of going in blind here. That being said, I was not prepared for what Alive from New York turned out to be. The best way I can think to describe this special and Pete's performance overall is to say it's extremely awkward. It's awkwardly written, awkwardly performed, and awkwardly edited. The issues with this special start from the beginning. As Pete Cold opens with a story about the time Louis C.K. attempted to get him fired from SNL for smoking too much weed. So Louis C.K. tried to get me fired from SNL my first year, and this is that story. Now, not that I think every stand-up special has to conform to a strict format, but the decision to cold open with this story doesn't make much sense to me. It wasn't a choice that was impactful to the special, and it doesn't set the tone for what's to come. Seemingly, the only reason the set is structured the way it was is because Davidson had this story about Louis C.K. that he wanted to tell, but it didn't fit into the rest of his material. This bit isn't the worst thing I've ever seen, but it's not great. Pete meanders through a story about how Louis called him out for smoking too much weed after he hosted SNL. Look how fucking high Pete is, that fucking idiot. Just getting fucking high at work, you stupid fuck. You're gonna smoke your career away, idiot. The day after this incident, Pete received a call from Lorne Michaels' office and went to meet with him. Lorne told him that Louis had just been down there and said Pete was smoking his career away. Ultimately, nothing really came of it, but Pete said finding out that he didn't have the approval of such a beloved comic was deflating to him. You know, and I had to like sit with that for like five years, you know? You can kind of guess where this is going. And then one glorious morning. <laughs> the problem with this bit is that Pete just doesn't do much with it. He's able to eke out one relatively funny joke here when describing how CK's accusers could have gotten him to stop by just smoking some pot. He would have been like, oh, f is that weed? Holy shit, you fucking animals! I'm telling! But other than that, it just doesn't lead to anything except for an unfunny and confusing segment about jerking off alone that gets some chuckles from the audience. Just, you know, be in the room with me, you know? Is it okay? Um... <laughs> this story is nearly eight minutes long. It's the opening bit that is supposed to set the stage for everything to come, but it already feels like Davidson has nothing to say. He seems to have no enthusiasm for the story and no confidence in his material, but it only gets worse from here. After a cut and a brief title card, Pete starts to tell a story about how his friend, who he financially supports, just had a kid instead of getting a job. And I was like, wow, that's like the exact opposite of a job. He uses this story to start working into some mediocre material about babies. This is the point in the special where I started to realize how annoying Pete's voice and delivery were. It's not quite as bad as whatever Chris D'Elia was doing on No Pain, but it's not tremendously far off either. <laughs> At times he sounds like Christopher Walken got karate chopped in the throat. They're like, bro, it cries! Other times he sounds strangely like Bill Burr in terms of his pronunciation and delivery. Christmas is spent in Ohio. This is sick! This is awesome! I can't believe we're doing this! On yet other occasions, he is barely audible, as he does little more than grumble and groan his way through material. <laughs> My poor mother. This is, of course, when he isn't giggling at his own jokes or pausing for mind-bogglingly long periods of time. Ah, <laughs> uh, you're laughing. But we'll get to that a bit later. Pete starts rambling about how easy he thinks it would be to take care of a baby. This leads to a story about Pete babysitting his nephew and something weird happened. Something weird uh, happened when I was babysitting. Uh... I can almost guarantee that whatever you're thinking, Pete said something weirder. He's teething, so he just like grabbed my hand and started like sucking my fingers, but like good. Oh, sure. This joke is legitimately one of the weirdest things I've heard a comedian try to work into a set. Like I definitely left it in there for a second. 
Pete tries to justify its inclusion by saying that this is a comedy special, not a town hall meeting. But the problem is, this strange and creepy bit is just sort of shoehorned in there for no particular reason, and there is virtually no other material like it on the special. Like, he just wanted to drop this edgy, pedophile joke in the middle of an otherwise anemic special about nothing. To me, this signals where a lie from New York basically falls apart. For as long, boring, and irrelevant as the Louis C.K. story was, it still had some semblance of structure. There was an idea you could sort of follow. For roughly the next 30 minutes, Pete rambles through a series of not even half-baked bits with seemingly no purpose or direction, no segues, and only a few extremely weak narrative threads tying things together. This is probably the biggest issue with this special, the sheer amount of filler. Pete has a few very broad bits here, such as some commentary on men and women not communicating about what makes each other bust a nut, or talking about that one gay friend women have that gets a little too handsy with them. If you hate pussy so much, why are you cuddling it? Very weird. But they're just so tepid and uneventful. There is nothing new or interesting here. And that is not to say that every joke has to be groundbreaking, but Pete is bringing almost nothing to the table. And it's not even as if the jokes are being well received either. Most of the time, Pete's punchlines get like a 3 out of 10 in terms of crowd reaction. Like, you know, you just asked me to like divide. <laughs> but he bombs more than once in this special, and they leave it in. Where you're like, ha ha ha, next stop, please. Um, that was me in a cab. Just doing laps every day like, is this even? Is this even? No. Uh, they decide all people's futures. <laughs> the issue is compounded by Pete frequently giggling at his own poorly landed punchlines. <laughs> <laughs> or trailing off into barely intelligible grumblings. I guess I'll just shoot a special and tell everybody. Pete does this a lot. Okay. I feel like this material wouldn't be so bad if he wasn't interrupting his own jokes constantly to pause for literally seconds at a time for no reason. I don't know whether this was a deliberate stylistic choice or if he just had that little confidence in his jokes, but it drains the energy out of this already dull material and kills his momentum. At one point, Pete stops in the middle of his bit because... <laughs> Sorry. Well, sometimes you say giggly things. And it's honestly one of the most uncomfortable things I've seen in a stand-up special. It's so bad I think Pete might have actually forgotten his next line and was just buying himself some time because he ends up basically restating his premise and starting the joke over. Um, no, but yeah, girls should tell guys uh, how to make them come. This is the most annoying way Pete pads the special out in my opinion. On multiple occasions, he more or less restarts a joke or gives you a recap of the joke in the middle of the joke. It's especially bad during the bit about his controversy with Dan Crenshaw. Pete drags this bit out for 10 minutes to ultimately say little more than that he made fun of Dan Crenshaw's eye patch on Weekend Update and had to apologize for it. Uh, I got in trouble because uh, I made fun of this gentleman with an eye patch. Before he actually gets into that story, though, there is this really unfunny aside describing how when he gets pulled over by police, he plays Billy Joel music because he thinks it will make them think he's not a piece of shit. Does anybody want to get pulled over put on, like, Billy Joel? Like many things on this special, the joke seems to serve no purpose, and it bombs. Can you turn off Bill Withers? <laughs> when Pete starts telling the story about the Dan Crenshaw controversy, he does such a poor job of it that it's kind of hard to follow what he's even saying. The long story short is that he wrote a joke about Dan Crenshaw looking like a hitman in a porno that he was going to tell on Weekend Update. Okay, this guy looks like a hitman in a porno, right? However, he quickly starts to veer away from this story into multiple tangents. While attempting to explain how the porno hitman joke was harmless, he ends up bombing. Um, that was me in a cab. Uh, and the... And tells the editor that they can cut that part out. <laughs> yeah, I'll cut that, cut that right out. 
Was this intentional and supposed to be a meta joke? I don't know, but the fact that it was met with murmuring from the crowd while Davidson awkwardly paused is a sign to me that it should have been cut out either way. It adds nothing to the show, and if anything, it's just embarrassing. Less than a minute later, he brings the show to another screeching halt by telling the audience he wants to do something. Congrats on fucking. Uh, thanks for unpausing and continuing to watch. At this point, I was filled with so much secondhand embarrassment that I wanted to crawl under something. When Opie and Anthony was still around, they had a term for this feeling, douche chills. It's basically when something is so cringe-inducing and embarrassing, it gives you a physical sense of being uncomfortable for someone else. And I was douche chilling out at this point. After about a minute of this stuff, he gets back to the ponderous Dan Crenshaw story by describing how, as he was about to tell a joke on Weekend Update, an SNL writer informed him that he did some research and thought Dan might have lost his eye in a war, and psych! Pete decides to do a callback to that horrible joke about unpausing Netflix after fucking from a minute ago. Yo, you fucked again? That's awesome, dude. Thank you again. For as boring as this Dan Crenshaw bit is, and as painful as the callback joke was, it's even worse because Pete missed an opportunity for an authentically funny callback joke. As Pete explained, he was trying to be mindful before the weekend update segment, but he was also on shrooms at the time. So like being mindful is like fucking ugh, top of the list tough. Which would have been a perfect opportunity to say something like, okay, maybe Louie wasn't totally wrong. It would have even been a point in the special where awkwardly mumbling his way through a punchline would have worked. But no, a missed opportunity. The Dan Crenshaw bit doesn't really have a payoff either. After several more partially formed jokes, Pete just kind of insinuates that he was told to apologize. And that's it. This is one of the only moments where Pete does have a segue because he explains that he basically did for Dan Crenshaw what, what Ariana Grande did for him. I sucked his dick at SNL. I don't have much to say about the Ariana Grande segment because, while it's probably the most consistently funny part of the special, that still makes it like a 3 out of 10. It's also celebrity gossip from 3 plus years ago that I doubt my fanbase of mostly 47 year old truckers are particularly interested in. Outside of one punchline about Grande painting herself brown and going on the cover of Vogue to trash him, there isn't really anything funny or noteworthy here. This brings us to 9-11. Reminds me of that tragedy. <laughs> Pete opens by saying his dad died on 9-11, which he was told he should tell people beforehand because some people don't know. Pete disagreed with this because he thought it would just stop the show and make things awkward. I won. <laughs> I was right. While the bar for this special has been set incredibly low, this is actually a clever joke. And it's kind of a shame that it didn't get a bigger response from the audience in my opinion. Personally, I thought the 9-11 material had the most promise of anything on the special. His experiences losing his father, who was a firefighter, and being forced to deal with that trauma as a child is unique and compelling. I think he did pull some interesting material from those experiences on this special, such as when he told the story of his mother using the compensation money she received to buy a swimming pool, in the hopes that it would cheer up young Pete and his sister, though that didn't exactly have the desired outcome. Uh, swim in the death pool. Uh. There is a well of material Davidson can't tap into here, much of it being dark and emotionally challenging, and Pete has done that in the past. And briefly during the special, it does feel like he's going in that direction. Thank God Osama bin Laden didn't miss his alarm clock. You know why? I wouldn't have a fucking pool! Unfortunately, this segment suffers from the same problem plaguing much of A Lie from New York. The bits feel underdone and underwhelming. They're poorly fleshed out, and after a few jokes, Davidson quickly moves on to talking about his dad specifically. He starts this off by talking about doing research on his dad that year for a project, but as he's done numerous times so far, he quickly goes off on a tangent about Staten Island, which just feels like more filler. I don't know if you knew this, but this place has the biggest dump, you know? He returns to the thread about speaking to his dad's friends to get stories about him from before he passed away. But, again, he interrupts the joke to go off on another tangent about parents telling you to finish your plate as a kid. Always used to finish his plate. <laughs> finish it? Why? These are not terrible jokes, but they add nothing, and he spends like three minutes on them when we still haven't even gotten to the stories about his dad. Finally, he gets back around to that plot thread for real, and his dad's friends reveal that he used to do a lot of coke. And he was like, Oh, we used to do coke all the time! 
this actually leads to what is a pretty good punchline. Zach, you picture that? Your house is on fire, a fire truck pulls up, and then my dad gets out and he's like, let's fucking go! Woo! No helmet! With one issue. When I was watching this special, I had no sense that we were getting this close to Pete's closing punchline. Closing bit, sure, but I was not at all prepared for the set to come to such an abrupt end, because there was so much filler in the story that I assumed there had to be something more to it, other than essentially one solid punchline before the show ends. Well, it kind of ends. Shortly afterward, Pete comes back out for one more story about his dad. Similarly, this is another story told to him secondhand by one of his dad's friends. This is about a trip the two of them took to the Poconos. So one time, uh, me and your dad went to the Poconos for a wedding. Where I assume they used a drone to get some sweet shots of the Poconos raceway. If you don't get that joke, don't worry. It was intended for literally one person. This story has many of the same problems as the previous story and the special as a whole. It's loaded with repetition, unnecessary details, and barely humorous jokes that are, at best, adjacent to the main story. After meandering through this filler for two minutes, Pete gets to the important part of the story, which is his dad's friend describing how he hooked up with the woman in the hotel room he was sharing with Pete's dad. After doing the deed, the friend notices a cigarette glow coming from the corner of the darkened room. And I go, Scott, I've been looking for you. And he goes, hey guys, thanks for the free show. <laughs> Again, this is a pretty good joke, when Pete stops rambling and eventually gets around to it. To me, this is indicative of the problems with this special as a whole. There is something moderately funny to be found in here, but it's buried deeply under the rubble of forgettable material and aborted jokes that feel intended to accomplish little more beyond eat time. It also shows the glaring narrative and structural issues with this special. Now, I can see why Pete would break the special up the way he did. The story about his dad sitting in the cuck chair is better throughout, but the punchline about his dad running into a burning building after a few nose beers is probably a better peak overall that he would have liked to end the show on. The problem is he took two decent jokes, spread them out over eight minutes with unfunny filler, then put a fake ending in the middle so that the show came to a screeching halt, and ended up robbing his closing punchline of any significance. Surely there could have been a better way to integrate these two stories into one cohesive segment. Honestly, even just putting the Pocono story first probably would have worked out okay. There are no segues in this special anyway, so it just confuses me. That's how I feel about this special in general. I feel like it was thrown together in a hurry. There are three to four segments that you could generously call bits, but they are painfully dragged out with dozens of jokes and digressions that do little more than pad the runtime. This is before you even get into Pete regularly stopping the show to pause for extended periods of time, or the constant repetition and outright restarting of jokes halfway through. And I understand the irony in the fact that I'm kind of doing the same thing in my review, but it's important to drive this fact home because of how much of a core issue it absolutely is. In the past, I've talked about how some of the specials I've reviewed could have been whittled down significantly. Somebody should have taken a fucking chainsaw to this material. Half of it should have been cut, and the other half should have been significantly reworked. These issues come together to make Alive from New York one of the worst specials I've encountered on this channel. Alive from New York is up there with the works of the Shobs, Schumers, and Dalias of the world, which is not a coveted place in stand-up history. This poses the question. Is it possible for a comic to come back from such a monumentally bad special? Enter Turbo Fonzarelli. And no, that isn't an unreleased Henry Winkler fighting game either. As I said in the beginning of this video, I didn't know what to expect going into Pete Davidson's comedy. After watching a live from New York, I was in an even worse position. I was completely clueless and frankly a little nervous about what Davidson's most recent Netflix special, Turbo Fonzarelli, would entail. I mean, that name does not instill confidence. Could it possibly be worse than a lie from New York? My past experience with comedians like Brendan Schaub would tell me that, as hard as this is to believe, these things can happen. With that in mind, this was a night and day comparison. Turbo Fonzarelli isn't just better than a lie from New York. It's so much better that I have a hard time believing these two specials were made by the same guy. Every complaint I had about a lie from New York has been rectified in this special, or at the very least, improved upon. The first four to five minutes are probably the weakest part of the special for me. He works through a few smaller premises that don't exactly hit on all cylinders, like how he came up with good ideas while taking ketamine. Like uh, an Italian sleep aid called Melatone. 
There is also a segment about Apple TV price gouging you on movies and some discourse on iPhones, which isn't bad per se. Started renting movies on Apple? Fuck Apple and their rental service. Scumbags. Really? You're gonna make me own Jeepers Creepers too? You fucking assholes. It's just pretty broad and generic. I think he was likely looking for some smaller jokes to open the special with before getting into the bit about how he's trying to get his mom to date again to get her off his back. It's been the 20 years of, of this fucking Nicholas Sparks bullshit. I'm tired of it. It is in this bit that I think Pete's abilities as a comedian actually come through. This material is pretty iffy, and a bad comedian could turn it ugly real fast by mishandling it, similar to what he did with that whole finger-sucking bit on a lie from New York. Yeah, you thought you fucking forgot about that shit, didn't you? Well, no, you don't get to. Because I don't get to. We will all have to remember that for the rest of our lives. On Turbo Fonzarelli, Pete handles the dicey, dicey material with surprising skill and aplomb. Point where I might just fuck her just to get her off my back. I have always thought one of the marks of a truly skilled comedian was the ability to do that high wire act, where they walk the audience into an uncomfortable situation or subject then hold them there on the edge of uncertainty as to whether they should actually be laughing at these jokes or not. Louis C.K. was a master of this, in my opinion, and I would argue it's his trademark as a performer. Because they do taste delicious, but they don't taste as good as a young boy does and shouldn't. I'm not saying Pete Davidson is that good, but he does a serviceable job. There aren't many comedians who could venture into this territory, and there are even fewer who could create something interesting out of it other than shock value humor. But Pete does, and the joke is actually well structured, from comparing his mom's pussy to a refurbished iPhone, then to a classic car that used to be owned by an old man who died and his son kept it in the garage for 23 years, which results in a pretty clever callback joke. Better make a move fast. I hear the son's thinking of keeping it for himself. This leads to one of the few transitions or segues in the special, as Pete begins to talk about his mom always being too tired to help him deal with his problems as a kid, and her advice was usually just to take a nap. And she'd be like, have you slept today? You look, you look tired. This was an issue for young Petey because when he was 10 years old, he thought he was gay. For Leonardo DiCaprio. I was obsessed with Leonardo DiCaprio. I was in love. Pete then goes on to talk about his appreciation for Leo. If I'm being honest, I think it's another one of the weaker parts of the special, and it feels the most like filler. Looking at babes going, hey, ugh, I still fuck. Ugh. Thankfully, it's not very long, and we get back around to the funny material when Pete talks about revealing his problem to his mom, who snaps. And I go, I think I'm gay. And she goes, are you tired? And I go, no, I'm just... She goes, why do you think you're gay? I go, because of Leonardo DiCaprio. She goes, this is how you know you're gay. She goes, let me ask you this. Do you want to suck his dick? Pete's performance here is great, as he's reciting these absurd lines as his mother, interrogating him as to if he's really gay for Leo. She goes, do you want to suck his dick? And I just keep going, because I don't know. Do you want to get fucked from behind, Peter? By Leonardo DiCaprio? He's honestly kind of on fire here. She goes, you get Leonardo, and he's going to town. His timing and delivery are very solid in my opinion. I just said no, and she goes, not gay. <laughs> the bit about fulfilling a dying child's wish for the Make-A-Wish Foundation is similarly well written and delivered. By the way, not getting a lot of offers. Believe it or not, it's not a lot of people's dying wish to meet me. It's usually their wish for me to die, actually. Complete opposite. It could have been another one-dimensional shock value bit, but Pete turned it into something interesting and different by describing how, since he doesn't have the equivalent of John Cena's belts to show the kids, he decided to share a bunch of his secrets, which he even described as being a cathartic experience. He was so happy. I was so happy. And a huge weight was, like, lifted off of me, too. I got to, like, tell him some stuff. But over the coming days, he started to get nervous. And a week went by, and I went on the Make-A-Wish website, and the kid was still alive. I think it's somewhat obvious where Pete is going with this joke. But as I've said in the past, the direction of a joke being predictable is not automatically a bad thing. And I think Davidson managed to find an interesting perspective that led to several funny punchlines. And then, you know, finally, you know, they called, you know, and uh, yeah, wish fulfilled. This brings me to what I think is the best bit from Turbo Fonzarelli, and the one that takes it from being a solid special to actually being a pretty good one, in my view. That is Pete's story of his interactions with the stalker. It's been a very sad year. I lost my stalker. 
The story is pretty long, I think it's upwards of 20 minutes, which is a substantial chunk of the special. So I'm not going to pick over it in minute detail, partly because I think it's funny enough that I don't want to ruin a lot of it in case some of you want to watch. The way I see it, I don't think the length of this segment is to its detriment, because during this bit I think Pete's abilities as a storyteller stand out. He navigates a complex and interesting story of the multiple encounters he had with his stalker. That started with her showing up at his house with a t-shirt that had a picture of his face on it. And it wasn't even a flattering photo. Pete was uncertain of how to handle the situation, so he went elementary school on her. I was like, you can't be here because this is where I go poopy. In most other circumstances, I might find a line like this a bit cringe, but something about trying to explain to a mentally unstable person why they can't be at your house kind of makes it work. She seemed a little nuts, you know. I I'm crazy, so like crazy people could, you know, they we could tell. Like, how would you handle it? Some fucking weird shit might come out of your mouth in that situation. She was like, what? I was like, yeah, I go poopy here. She goes, ugh. This leads to Pete Stalker showing up at his house while he was out of town and his mom was house-sitting with her friend Terry. The Stalker told Pete's mom that he was one of his friends, so his mom let her in and they all watched TV together for several hours before Pete's mom called him and said one of his friends was over. I go, is she hot? And my mom goes, I go, you're under attack! Run for your fucking life! Once Pete's mom learned of the true nature of the Stalker, she called one of Pete's real friends, who is a cop. He then came over and apprehended the stalker before calling Pete to inform him that the stalker brought a present. My boy just goes, Oh! No! This is disturbing! Now, I'm not going to spoil what the present was because I think it's a genuinely good twist that leads to several funny punchlines. But let's just say that it ties back to his initial meeting with the stalker. From here, they end up going to court so that Pete can get a restraining order. But as Pete learned, the stalker was declared mentally unfit to appear in court. One chick is into me, off to the nut house. Pete also learned that the stalker claimed she was communicating with him telepathically. Ultimately, Pete's stalker was given six months in a mental rehab facility. To Pete's chagrin. What? I was like, that's not safe. I was like, that's like the one place I'd bump into her. If I'm being honest, I really like this whole segment. Especially towards the end of Pete talking about the restraining order case where he starts to pretend that he actually can communicate with a stalker telepathically. It's creative and amusing without drifting too far into wacky territory. You weren't supposed to tell anybody that we could do this. The stalker bit as a whole is not perfect. I'll admit that. There are several jokes, particularly the poop and Crohn's disease related bits, that are just childish and a bit weird to me. I got a poopy butthole as well. As a whole, I think it's very good though. Pete spins an entertaining yarn about what would be a very awkward and uncomfortable, if not genuinely frightening experience in real life. Mixed into this narrative are multiple asides and digressions that, unlike in a lie from New York, do not detract from the bigger story. They generally add to it and make it funnier. Yes, he exaggerated it, and he even admits doing so for legal reasons, which I have some mixed feelings about. However, I don't view this as being the same as Brendan Schaub outright lying about the fight with Travis Brown. Davidson didn't exaggerate the story to make himself look more heroic or his story more grandiose. It's a joke, and he exaggerated the joke to make it funnier, which most comedians do. But on this issue, I will let you guys form your own opinions. The next bit is about how Pete decided to move to the woods because his address got leaked. I got super freaked out because my address got out. To tell you the truth, this bit does feel a little bit like downtime compared to the rest of the special. It's really all in service of effectively one punchline, where Pete pretends to be a lord and demands that his black realtor show him the master bedroom. SHOW ME THE MASTER BEDROOM! Which Pete didn't know was no longer called the master bedroom due to the connotations it had from slavery. DON'T INTERRUPT THE MASTER! I don't really think it's a bad bit, it certainly doesn't take away from the show, but it doesn't add anything either. If you were to ask me which segment of the special I would remove, it would probably be this one because it seems unnecessary. It's not bad enough to call it filler, but I do think it was a way of spacing out his stalker story and his closing bit, which is a story about how Pete's mom once made a fake Twitter account to defend him from trolls. The setup here is pretty simple. Pete's mother made a fake Twitter account to defend him from haters and trolls. She was clever enough to make the username Joe Smith 1355 but still used her real name and picture in the profile. But the profile name was Amy Davidson. Icing on top, profile picture, also Amy Davidson. Yes. 
At the time, Pete only saw the username and thought a fan had his back, until the tweets defending him got too specific. He may have thought he was gay as a child because of Leonardo DiCaprio. After realizing it was his mom behind the Joe Smith 1355 account, he called her up, where she asked him what gave it away, and he explained the username and picture. She goes, oh, Terry! <laughs> While the story about his mother defending him against trolls on Twitter is a bit short, I think it's concise and well-delivered. The callback to the Leonardo DiCaprio joke from earlier is well executed, and the final punchline is a great way of putting a stamp on what turned out to be a surprisingly good special in my view. Is Turbo Fonzarelli a perfect special? Of course not. But few specials are. Is it a great special? That might be too much praise, but I think that will depend on your personal preference. Compared to A Lie from New York, it felt like George Carlin in his prime. When I try to be objective and just view it for what it was, not in comparison to one of the worst specials I've ever seen, Turbo Fonzarelli is good. Maybe even very good. It's definitely above average in my opinion. It's a well-conceived special. The stories are interesting and different. The pacing is good enough that a 50-minute special moves along at a good clip, without shoving something new in your face every 30 seconds. Aside from a couple of misses here and there, the jokes are well-written, and it made me laugh or at least giggle frequently. Pete's delivery also deserves another mention because it's not just good relative to how bad it was on a live from New York, it's genuinely good. Where he was meek, awkward, and lacking in confidence on a live from New York, he actually feels like an experienced professional stand-up here. There is no stuttering, stumbling, mumbling, or awkward pausing. He delivers this material with confidence and more importantly, personality. Even when discussing awkward or taboo subjects like his mother's sex life or a Make-A-Wish kid dying, he doesn't quail away. Even when a joke doesn't necessarily get a great reception, he doesn't let it act like a speed bump that completely fucks up his rhythm and pacing. He just keeps going, and at many points in the show, he's cooking. This is what I would expect from a seasoned comic on their third stand-up special. Personally, I think that confidence is a direct result of the second big improvement between Pete's two Netflix specials. The material is just better. Like Anthony Cumia's taste in women, A Lie from New York was feeble and underdeveloped. There were arguably four bits on the whole special, and they were stretched out with filler like the comedic equivalent of a cheap hot dog. His material on this special feels like he put more effort into writing and working out the kinks through performing it. I'm not going to say every joke was a home run for me because some of them were still pretty weird. Say cute things like, I'm a crispy little dolphin. Yeah. What is it with these guys and dolphins? Let's add another one to the checklist. Additionally, he still doesn't really segue between the larger chunks of the show, but all of those chunks are well written in my opinion. That said, when making a video like this where I spent half of it talking about how bad his previous special was, it's hard not to compare them. What I will say is that there is a drastic difference between the two of them. Turbo Fonzarelli is significantly better in almost every conceivable way. What the takeaway from that is, I don't know. Why a lie from New York was so bad remains unclear to me. What this new special says to me is that Pete Davidson is not a shitty comic. He isn't a hack. He has some talent, and if given time to write material and work it out properly, Pete Davidson is capable of making a pretty solid special. Will he be able to do this again? That remains to be seen. But seeing somebody swing so wildly from such a terrible special to an honestly pretty good one is interesting. He arguably pulled himself back from the brink, in my opinion. I mean, imagine someone like Brendan Schaub or Amy Schumer coming out and dropping a 7 out of 10 special. It would be impressive. In that light, I'm kind of curious to see what Pete Davidson does next. As always, I'd like to thank you for watching, as well as liking, commenting, and subscribing. And a special thank you to my supporters on Patreon who help make these videos possible. Thank you. Trog Milker, Squirt, Jonas Namanson, Rusty Shackelford, Jackson, Fightback CBD, Mike Robals, Bone CK, Gaius Anisha Patton, Scott Richmond, Random Candor, Fuzi Yunus, Dot Old Neon, Timothy Lee Peterson, Julius Caesar Has Jungle Fever, Ellie, Firebrand, Quasi, Snepsts, Alex, and Anime.